16-year-old Hannah Truelove had her whole life in front of her. She dreamed of going on to college, becoming a veterinarian, and living life on her own terms. However, in the months leading up to her death, she began issuing a series of tweets which implied she had reason to fear for her safety. On a Thursday night, Hannah was seen hanging out with other teens near her apartment complex. By 9 p.m., she hadn't returned home, and it was unlike her to stay out past curfew. When she wasn't home later, her mother called the police and reported her missing. An initial search was delayed by heavy rains, but Hannah couldn't be found. The next evening, while police were searching, a man in the apartment complex reported finding a body. When police arrived, they found the 16-year-old in the woods. She'd been murdered, and her death would launch a town into confusion and shock. While residents believed this had to have been the act of an outsider, police believed that Hannah's death had not been random, and she more than likely had been murdered by someone she knew. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 106, The Murder of Hannah Truelove. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the truly horrifying murder of 16-year-old Hannah Truelove. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders, disappearances, and other crimes. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence Podcast. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show as it is a one-man operation and you'd like to get some Trace Evidence swag, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options and contact information, as well as thorough information on all episodes. To submit case suggestions, you can visit the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 16-year-old Hannah Truelove walked into the woods behind her Georgia apartment complex and never returned. Less than 24 hours later, her body was found and the hunt for her killer began. This is episode 106, The Murder of Hannah Truelove. Oftentimes, we think of social media as a way of coming together, a place to share ideas and interests. Sure, there's also a dark side. Trolls, harassment, people just looking to raise the ire of someone else. This is especially true, it seems, in recent years, where a lot of social media has become a place for more arguments than conversations, but it wasn't always that way, or at least it didn't seem to be as prevalent. However, Social media is also playing a role in criminal investigations, whether it's what people speculate about a particular crime, or in some cases, the perpetrators themselves posting about the crime they committed. There is an aspect of social media that can sometimes aid and sometimes frustrate investigators. In the case of 16-year-old Hannah Truelove, her social media tells a cryptic and haunting story in the days leading up to her murder. Hannah Truelove was born on May 18, 1996, to parents Mona Harris and Jeff Truelove. She would have a brother, Clint, and a sister, Jessica. Hannah herself has been described as a sweet and kind young woman, the type who would develop tight bonds with her family and with her circle of friends. Jeff Truelove described his daughter by saying, quote, She was a very loving girl. She was just daddy's little girl. End quote. One thing which comes up frequently in articles about Hannah was how caring and compassionate she was. Joshua Morrow, a friend of Hannah's, told the Daily News, quote, She had a huge heart. She always put people before herself. End quote. Hannah's school counselor described her as a gentle spirit who was, quote, calm, respectful, well-mannered, and just seemed to love life. End quote. Hannah was a bright young woman with a focus and determination about her life. Multiple articles and her obituary 
reference her activities in gymnastics and her future dream of becoming a veterinarian. Her love for animals, it seems, was undeniable, and her interest in pursuing that career can only expand on her desire to work with them. Everyone who spoke of Hannah spoke only highly of her demeanor, mindset, and determination. There were, of course, some issues, as are to be expected with a teenager. There was some truancy in relation to her attendance at Gainesville High School, although some of that may have been due to her concerns. Hannah rode the bus to school, and according to her father, she was afraid of it. For some reason, which has never been fully explained, there was something about the bus itself that bothered her. Speculation has been for a long time that there may have been someone on that bus that Hannah had reason to fear. Her posts on Twitter may offer some insight into that particular angle. Taking a look at Hannah's Twitter account, which she began just three months before her death and is still accessible today, minus a few tweets, one can easily see her love for music. Her feed is filled with quotes from songs and retweets of musicians. There are jokes, back and forths with friends, and of course pictures, everything you would expect to find on a teenager's Twitter. However, there were also heartfelt and painful posts, ones which seemed to indicate some issues in Hannah's life Though for many, it's difficult to sort through the often scattered feelings of a teenager versus serious life concerns and worries. Police would later suggest that, while they found several of Hannah's tweets concerning and compelling, they didn't place a lot of stock in those tweets being directly connected with what happened to her. For some, however, they believe Hannah may not only have known her killer, but may have been tweeting about him in the days before she was killed. Hannah lived with her mother, Mona, at the Lake Lanier Club Apartments located at 1701 Dawsonsville Highway in Gainesville, Georgia. Gainesville is located in Hall County and is in the northeastern section of Georgia. Around the time of Hannah's murder, the population was around 33,000 residents in an area of only 35 square miles. Gainesville High School, which Hannah attended, holds an average of around 2,000 students and is a well-ranked school in the area. Gainesville High School is located approximately 2.5 miles to the southeast of Hannah's home, and while I don't know for sure, it doesn't appear that her bus ride could have been excessively long, which would make her fears about being on the bus even more strange. Now, maybe the bus made a lot of stops and it took longer than it would to drive yourself. The idea that Hannah had something to be afraid of during her ride, though, has only led to more speculation and questions about the person who may be responsible for her murder. There's this question about Hannah's phone, which is a whole confusing aspect of this case. At the time of her death, Hannah did not have a cell phone, though there seems to be some evidence that she may have previously. Supposedly, Hannah had her privilege of having a phone removed by her mother, Due to some kind of an issue in school, her father, who lives separately, wanted to get her a phone, and in an interview with CNN, he stated, quote, I was going to get her a telephone. She needed a cell phone, and her mother wouldn't let her have one. And they don't have any phone other than her mother's cell phone that she carries to work, and I wanted her to have a phone there with her. Every child has, but no phone. She was upset with her mother about that, end quote. Mr. Truelove would later say he was unaware of any issues at school and described Hannah as being a good girl all summer. The lack of a phone may explain some of Hannah's tweets throughout the summer months and also her uncommon method of communicating. At the time of her death, Hannah was communicating with her friends by way of a Nintendo DS, a handheld gaming device. There's a preloaded program on the DS called pic to chat in which you can send texts and drawings back and forth through so-called chat rooms. A user can have four different chat rooms going at once, each with the capacity of holding 16 people. And so this was a method to communicate with friends bypassing a cell phone where someone unable to have a phone, such as Hannah. It should be noted, the DS does not have a mobile data connection, meaning that in order to chat from it, the user has to be connected to Wi-Fi. To this day, Hannah's DS is held by police and actually sits on the desk of Lieutenant Dan Franklin of the Hall County Sheriff's Department as a reminder of Hannah's case and an inspiration to keep investigating. Franklin talked about the device, saying, quote, I keep her Nintendo DS close as a reminder. That was how she last communicated, 
End quote. In the days leading up to Hannah's murder, she made several tweets which have only added to the confusion and speculation about her final moments. On August 12th at 2.03 p.m., Hannah tweeted out, I got me an ugly-ass stalker. Six days later, on August 18th, she would make two tweets, one at 7.23 p.m. reading, So Scared Right Now, and one at 7.38 p.m. reading, Every Time We Talk, I Feel Sick. On August 22nd, two days before her murder, Hannah would tweet, I need to move out of these dang apartments. Her final tweet would happen on August 23rd with her replying, um, yes ma'am, to a since-deleted tweet. The tweet seems to be in response to a tweet from the previous day in which Hannah wrote, I'm getting fat, I have a little tummy right now. Investigators poured over Hannah's social media, including these tweets, many of which have since been removed, maybe at the request of law enforcement, but ultimately, they didn't believe these tweets were connected to her death. Thursday, August 23rd, would be the day Hannah was reported missing. Everything began typically, with Hannah going off to school and returning home seemingly without incident. Hannah's mother often worked into the evening, and so Hannah was used to arriving home to an empty apartment. At approximately 4 p.m., several neighbors in the gated apartment complex reported seeing Hannah sitting at the picnic tables in the common area. Other witnesses would also come forward, with the last confirmed sighting of Hannah taking place in that same area, though reportedly she was with some friends and they were standing near a sewer or drain jutting out from the grass. Now, while Hannah and her mother may not have been getting along well at the time, as has been implied in some articles, Hannah still typically followed her usual routine, which involved her being home before dark. According to Hannah's mother, She was never out past dark and knew better than that. At approximately 9 p.m., Jeff True Love received a call from Mona. In the call, Jeff states Mona asked if he had picked up Hannah or if she had come to see him. When Jeff explained that Hannah wasn't with him, Mona replied that she hadn't come home. Jeff later explained that Mona was concerned since it was getting dark, telling CNN, quote, She said, well, she's not here and it's starting to get dark. And I said, well, she should be there. End quote. When Hannah failed to return, Mona placed a call to 911 to report her daughter missing. In part, the transcript of the 911 call reads, quote, My daughter is not home yet. She's 16. Her name is Hannah Truelove. Normally, she's back by dark, nine at the latest. End quote. When the 911 operator asked if Hannah was ever doing things like this in the past, Her response was no, not after dark. Police responded to the call, beginning a search which would include going through the large apartment complex as well as the neighborhood surrounding that area, but they failed to turn up any clues of where Hannah may have been. They searched paths which were often traveled, including some which went into the woods, but there was nothing substantial located, nor anything to suggest Hannah had even been in the area. Search efforts were badly impacted as a storm approached and the rain became thick and heavy. Approximately two to three inches of rain fell in just a few hours, washing out certain areas and running through the mud and dirt of the woods which surrounded the Lake Lanier apartments. Officers would ultimately halt the search, waiting for the weather to pass. Assuming they might find answers through Hannah's friends, police arrived at Gainesville High School the following day. Friday, August 24th, and requested to speak with those that Hannah hung out with most often. No one seemed to have any idea where she could have gone, nor did anyone at the time express concerns about her tweets. Several friends said that Hannah had never mentioned anything to them about a stalker, and while they had seen her tweets, they didn't take them very seriously. A friend of Hannah's, Christine Robles, told the Daily Mail, quote, I didn't take it seriously. I think I could have helped and talked to her about it and taken it more seriously. End quote. When Jeff Truelove was spoken to by authorities and the topic of his daughter's tweets and a potential stalker were brought up, he explained that it was just something that he had never heard about. Speaking with the Atlanta News Now, Jeff stated, quote, She made no mention of anything to me, but maybe it was one of those things that kids tell to kids. End quote. Less than 24 hours after she disappeared, 
The search would be officially called off when a man made a horrifying discovery. Dennis Creaseman's daughter had recently had surgery, and so he had come to the apartment complex to help take care of her. On Friday evening, Creaseman decided to take a walk down to the lake to get some fresh air and take a break from the busyness of the day. According to investigators, Creaseman did not follow a pre-laid path, but instead walked into the tree line heading towards the lake. Approximately a quarter mile from the complex, in the woods, Creaseman came across the body of Hannah Truelove. Creaseman quickly called 911, and the official transcript he stated, quote, I'm walking in the woods behind the Lanier apartments, and I have found a dead lady, end quote. Creaseman would go on to suggest that, based on what he was seeing, she appeared to have been dead for two or three days, though Hannah had only gone missing just 24 hours earlier. While the caller's statements about the time the body had been there initially caused some suspicion, Sergeant Stephen Wilbanks with the Sheriff's Department dismissed that, explaining in a televised interview, quote, My guess, and it's strict that, it's just his estimate based on what he saw there at the scene. There was nothing, too, that would indicate to us that that was the occasion. Of course, we all know she had not been there that long. To the untrained eye, sometimes people just don't realize how long a person may or may not have been there. End quote. For the record, Creaseman was never considered a suspect by investigators. Initially, the Gainesville City Police took the investigation as the apartment complex was located in the city limits. However, it would later be determined that the location of Hannah's body was actually within the bounds of the Hall County Sheriff's Office. This would not be determined immediately, though, resulting in the sheriff's office having to go back over certain evidence for their own interpretation. Hannah had been found in a small ravine designed to handle water runoff from the apartment complex parking lot. At the time, the coroner's office and law enforcement were very tight-lipped about Hannah's cause of death, saying only that it had been violent. An autopsy would be performed the following Monday, and after it, her death was officially labeled as a homicide. While investigators hoped they could find answers at the scene, they would instead be frustrated by the disruption of the scene due to the previous night's rain. Lieutenant Dan Franklin of the Hall County Sheriff's Office would become the lead investigator. He would explain how the storm had destroyed a lot of evidence, saying in an interview how the crime scene can often be vital in determining what had happened, but in this case, it wouldn't be so easy. Franklin stated, quote, Thursday night into Friday morning, it rained about three inches, and so her body was submerged in running water for a period of time, and it washed away a lot of trace evidence, end quote. While at the time police held back the cause of death in hopes of helping them narrow down a suspect, it was later released that Hannah had been stabbed to death. Sadly, due to the storm, investigators didn't even have blood at the scene. In terms of why it was believed Hannah was killed in that location, as opposed to somewhere else and then being placed there, officials reported that there were no drag marks or indications that the body had been moved. Jeff Trulove received the difficult challenge of having to identify his daughter's body. According to an interview with Nancy Grace, Hannah's body was in bad shape, and it appeared as though she'd been in a fight, maybe with her killer. Jeff would go on to explain, quote, it looked like she got the crap beat out of her, possibly by another girl because she had a lot of scratches on her face. End quote. In a disturbing twist to the murder, police began operating under the belief that not only did Hannah know her killer, but in fact, she may have gone into the woods alongside this person willingly. Major Woodrow Tripp of the Hall County Sheriff's Office discussed this at a press conference. Here are some of Major Tripp's comments. She was not, uh, per se, forcibly brought there. Um, and at this point, uh, we believe that she was voluntarily in the area. Lieutenant Franklin expanded on this somewhat, telling reporters, quote, I think there were too many people out that evening. If she was taken against her will, they would have hurt something or hurt a struggle. I feel she came to this location voluntarily. Somebody she knew. End quote. This caused investigators to begin with classmates and friends. 
There were a lot of students and friends to interview, and police said they tried to do this as discreetly as possible, as they didn't want to start rumors when they showed up to speak with specific students. Gainesville High School brought in grief counselors to help students address the tragedy and confront their own pain and distress about it. For weeks after Hannah's death, locals feared that a serial killer might be on the loose, but authorities maintained that they believed this to have been a murder committed by someone Hannah knew and that Hannah was directly targeted. Joseph Scott Morgan, a former investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, agreed with this, saying, quote, For me, as an investigator, stabbing is not something that is impersonal. It generally indicates there is a closeness to the victim and the perpetrator. End quote. In addition to the students and friends, police canvassed the apartment complex and surrounding areas looking to get any information they could about Hannah and the days and hours leading up to her murder. It was later reported that while a large number of people had willingly cooperated and answered questions, there were some who didn't wish to speak to police, though the names of those individuals have never been released publicly. In the initial days after the discovery of Hannah's body and several news articles published discussing the case, police found themselves facing an onslaught of tips and leads. Many of these tips and leads were run down, but failed to deliver on their promise. However, there was one piece of information which investigators believe could be directly tied to Hannah's murder. One witness reported seeing an unfamiliar car in and around the apartment complex on August 23rd, the day Hannah was reported missing. Reportedly, the car had been at some point near Hannah. Whether or not Hannah had been in the vehicle is uncertain, though at least one report states that she may have exited the vehicle. When asked about this car, Hannah's father stated that, as far as he knew, the 16-year-old did not have any friends or acquaintances who were driving at that time. According to the witness, the vehicle was driven by a male, though he remains unidentified and has never come forward. Authorities believe he may possess knowledge about Hannah's death, or perhaps could be the perpetrator. There have also been statements, however, suggesting that there may have been more than one individual in that vehicle. Lieutenant Franklin later commented that he believed there was more than one person present at the time of Hannah's death, though he did not go into details explaining why he believed that. The vehicle has been described as a late 90s or early 2000s four-door light silver-colored Dodge or Chevrolet car with substantial damage to the front end and a driver's side door which is either a lighter shade of silver or perhaps white. The vehicle was seen in the apartment complex as well as around the area in which Hannah's body was found. Lieutenant Franklin explained that a witness who saw the car reported that a black male believed to be in his 20s with dreadlocks exited the vehicle from the passenger side and walked into the tree line surrounding the apartment complex, disappearing from the witness's view. Police are actively seeking anyone who may have any information about the vehicle, its passenger, or its driver. But eight years later, neither the vehicle nor the driver has ever been found or identified. Police urge that the vehicle may have been repaired in the days and weeks following the murder, though a search through body shops resulted in no indications that the car had been repaired in the area. When it came to Hannah's tweets... Investigators weren't convinced that they possessed any true clues to her case. A YouTube channel called Detective Pat posted an interview with Lieutenant Franklin where they asked him about the tweets and how they may or may not factor into the investigation. Franklin dismissed the tweets in his answer, which I'll now play for you. There was a lot of social media that she was involved in and she would tweet out that she was scared or that she felt she had a stalker. All that stuff was investigated and looked into um, and it was more just uh, teenage drama type stuff. Don't let this make you believe that they disregarded the tweets from the start though. They were taken seriously in the beginning, especially with Hannah mentioning a possible stalker. According to authorities, they were able to narrow down and identify the person Hannah was speaking about with the assistance of a few witnesses. Reportedly, this individual was thoroughly questioned and given a polygraph. Ultimately, the individual was cleared of being a suspect, and allegedly, this all spun out of a love triangle of sorts. According to what I could ascertain, 
Hannah had an interest in someone. Her father would later say she was into a boy from the neighborhood. While we can't know for certain the extent of her interest, we do know that the person mentioned on Twitter had an interest in Hannah, which she did not return. However, there was no belief at the time that this individual was involved in her murder. Unfortunately, Hannah's case began growing cold pretty early. While authorities have said that they have many persons of interest, people they have spoken to on more than one occasion, they don't have what they need to make a connection. Several times they've made pleas to the public for anyone with information to come forward, though no one has yet given them the information they need to make an arrest. At one point, Lieutenant Franklin stated, quote, We have some ideas, but we have to keep those close to the vest. End quote. In the interview I mentioned previously from YouTuber Detective Pat, Franklin addressed this again. I'll put the link to the full video in the show notes and on the website, but for now, I'm just going to play you this clip. We've had several persons of interest that we've, that we've looked at and we've interviewed. Um, and again, what we're looking for is somebody on the fringe, somebody that has knowledge, um, uh, that has a piece of information that will open the door to this, these people that we've, we've already looked at that, that we've, we're not ready to discount yet. It's been eight years since the murder of Hannah Truelove, and sadly, there has been little, if any, development. Police continue to work the case actively in hopes that they'll eventually get the break they need, but without the assistance of the public, they feel their chances of finding answers is slim. Really, the last major update to the case had to do with the information about the suspicious vehicle, and that didn't come out very long after Hannah's murder itself. Lieutenant Franklin, though, refuses to let the case go quiet. After being promoted to a supervisory position where he would no longer work on cases, Franklin specifically requested to remain on Hannah's case. He's haunted by it and is determined to find justice, not only for Hannah, but for her family as well. He told reporters that they will never give up. Over the years, there have been theories, speculation, rumors, and all manner of other interpretations of the crime, Hannah's tweets, and everything in between. Despite this, there remains only two prime theories about the murder, both of which carry their proponents and detractors. These theories split into two distinct possibilities. Either Hannah was murdered by a complete stranger who happened to be in the area that night, or she was the victim of a homicide from someone she may have known and trusted. Obviously, police lean towards the latter, however, they cannot dismiss the former. Hannah Truelove was brutally murdered in August of 2012. In just two months, on May 18th, it would have been her 24th birthday. By this time in her life, Hannah could have already earned her degree as a veterinarian or been very close to it. She could have built a life for herself, been working on the things that she loved near the people she cared for. Instead, in a terrible act of violence, someone stole her life away and left a family absolutely devastated in the wake of their horrible crime. Eight years is a long time to wait for answers, and an extremely long time for a family to try to come to terms with the loss of a teenage child and sister. For Hannah's mother, Mona, it's been an exceedingly trying time. She struggles with their difficult relationship at the time, one which any parent of a teenager can certainly relate to. In the years since, she's moved into a smaller apartment in the complex, not far from the one she shared with Hannah. She remains in possession of most of Hannah's belongings, having given some of her clothing away to a co-worker who has a teenage daughter. In an interview with the Gainesville Times, Hannah's mother described the depth of pain she's experienced, saying, quote, all I can hope for is justice for her. I don't see closure in the sense of people actually putting it behind them. I just don't see myself ever feeling that way. I'm not as trusting as I used to be, but I'm also in the same vein, it sounds contradictory, but I am also no longer fearful of things. That's just basically the worst thing that could ever happen to me, and it's already happened. I just don't fear much of anything anymore. She was taken away before her time. She didn't get to go to prom. She didn't get to graduate high school. She didn't get to have a family if she had wanted to do that. Someone just ripped that away. End quote. For her father, Jeff Truelove, it just never ends. He can never move on. 
he can never find peace until Hannah's killer is brought to justice. And for Jeff, he feels that his daughter is waiting for that answer as well. Here's Jeff discussing his daughter and the endless search for justice. I don't know if it's... I, no, it's, it's, I feel her presence all the time. I, I honestly feel like she can't go anywhere till she finds out, till we find out who did it. I've had Hannah's case in my files for several years. I've thought about covering her story many times, but I've always held out hoping for more information, hoping for a break or a new lead. Sadly, that hasn't happened, and her case remains as haunting as it was the day it happened. Police have worked hard to try and find Hannah's killer, but always seem to find themselves one piece of evidence short of what they truly need. Her case has been investigated by the Gainesville Police, the Hall County Sheriff's Office, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, but nothing major is broken, and while police possess more information than they've shared, there's still that missing puzzle piece they need to complete the picture. 16 years old with her whole life ahead of her, Hannah Truelove was brutally murdered. Over the years, investigators have spoken to everyone they can think of while also searching for a mysterious car and its driver and passenger. Could that car hold the key to Hannah's murder, or perhaps does the answer lie elsewhere? Could there be a connection between that car and the belief that Hannah was killed by someone she knew? Those are all questions everyone involved with the case would love to have the answers to, but for eight years they've struggled to find them. In the absence of solid evidence, there are those who disagree with authorities, believing that Hannah's murder may not have been conducted by someone she knew, but instead a stranger or strangers who saw a vulnerable young woman in the woods and decided to commit a horrible crime. So that's the theory we will begin with. Hannah had been in her mother's apartment complex for a few months prior to her death. We know from witnesses that she knew and spent time with other teens who lived in the complex or just in the area. We know on the day she was killed, she was hanging out in the picnic area and the grassy area nearby with some of those kids. However, at some point, Hannah ended up alone, walking into the woods. Whether or not she was simply going for a walk or maybe meeting someone she knew, no one can say for sure. All we do know is that Hannah never came back from the woods and her murderer remains unidentified. The most obvious place to begin with the stranger theory is with the unidentified car. Based on witness accounts, this wasn't a car that was in the area previously, and considering the lengths investigators went to, it doesn't appear that the car belonged to anyone living in the complex itself. The apartment complex has been described as being gated. Whether or not that implies that someone would need a code to gain entry is uncertain, though if that is the case, then it would suggest that whoever drove into the complex that day either knew the code from someone else or maybe had lived there previously. Without knowing for sure, it's difficult to speculate. It's hard to ignore that a witness saw a man exiting that vehicle and walking into the tree line, a tree line beyond which Hannah would ultimately be found. It seems a bizarre coincidence that a random guy would walk off into the woods and that a young woman would be murdered and there'd be no connections made at all. While coincidences do happen and truth can be stranger than fiction, this is certainly a detail of the case that raises my eyebrows. Of course, there's a debate about whether or not Hannah could have known one or all of the individuals in that car, but there doesn't seem to be any major developments in the case to suggest that. Investigators remain steadfast in their belief, though, that Hannah likely knew her killer. Hannah knowing her killer is based on a few different aspects of the case. Firstly, it's believed that stabbing murder suggests a personal connection, with the crime having to be one conducted in close quarters. Beyond that, police believe Hannah went into the woods of her own volition and was not dragged there, nor did she find herself involved in a struggle which would have led her into the ravine. Of course, rainfall had washed away much of the evidence, and assuming that the crime was committed prior to the rain, any evidence there could have been destroyed. Whether or not that would include footprints is hard to say, but no footprints have ever been reported as being part of the evidence. If it wasn't someone she knew, if this was a stranger attack, how would it go down? Does Hannah walk off into the woods and someone's there waiting for her? 
Is it possible that someone watched Hannah go into the woods and then followed her? Sadly, we don't know, but based on the fact that her death was initially described as violent even before the cause was announced, and her father described her face as being all scratched up, leading him to believe that the killer may have been female, that seems to suggest that whoever committed this crime was someone Hannah fought hard against. Now, I don't know how much credence is given to Jeff's account of it possibly being a female. Police certainly haven't ever commented along those lines, but it's not something that can be initially ruled out. Allegedly, Hannah had fears of riding the bus. Some have speculated that that could have been an issue with one or perhaps more than one men or women who, for whatever reason, wanted to hurt Hannah. Some have argued that it could have been an issue over a boy. Others believe it could have been some kind of a conflict related to typical teenager stuff that just went too far. However, all of those theories would imply that Hannah knew her killer rather than this being totally committed by a stranger. So if we're going to look deeper into the stranger angle, there's a lot we kind of have to dismiss which limits my abilities to truly believe in the stranger theory. Now, what if it was a stranger to Hannah, but Hannah herself may not have been a stranger to the perpetrator? She lived in an apartment complex, so it's surely possible that someone who lived there or had previously lived there could have been aware of her and developed an unhealthy attraction. Surely, people passing through could have noticed her as well. The question would become, why would someone want to murder Hannah? Anger, jealousy, infatuation, all are possibilities which can't be ruled out. While details of Hannah's murder have never been fully revealed, Many wonder if there was a possibility of sexual assault, or perhaps an attempted sexual assault. It's a sad reality of our world that a woman, all by herself at night, is surely viewed as a target for someone who's looking to commit such a crime. At a minimum, we have to basically know the crime was premeditated. This doesn't seem like some random person just came across Hannah and decided to murder her. The existence of the knife certainly implies that someone was planning to use it. Yes, some people carry knives on themselves all the time, especially in the South, and maybe that could have merely been a matter of trying to do something to Hannah, and when she fought back, the perpetrator reacted out of desperation. I've always found it interesting that police believe if Hannah had been taken against her will, that she would have screamed and made a fuss and someone would have heard something. I'm inclined to believe Hannah would have screamed when attacked, but no one reported hearing anything. Although it's important to note, she was approximately a quarter mile from the apartment complex when she was killed, so maybe her screams wouldn't have been heard after all. To me, there's too much here to suggest that Hannah did know her killer for this to have been random. Outside of the off chance someone was just hanging out in the woods looking for trouble, or noticed Hannah walking into the woods and decided to strike, there isn't much to work with on the stranger angle. If this had happened on the side of a road or in a parking lot, something more public, I'd be inclined to lead more towards the stranger attack. However, this wasn't exactly an isolated area, but it also wasn't one where I could imagine someone just hiding in the off chance that there'd be someone to attack. She wasn't on a trail. This wasn't somewhere that people often walked, and you'd imagine that if you were in the woods looking to kill someone, you'd probably do so closer to a place where you know people travel frequently. Hannah's killer could have been a stranger, there's no way to rule it out, but for almost everyone involved, this crime seems more likely to have been done by someone she knew, and so we'll move on to that aspect. There's been a lot of speculation about Hannah's tweets. I admit, it's difficult to dismiss them as teenage drama considering what happened to her. It's hard to see the tweet about a stalker and not assume that this person must have been connected, but police say they've cleared that individual. Of course, whether or not this is something they've said to make that person feel at ease rather than something they truly believe, we can't know. I tend to agree with authorities, though, that this is a stabbing, and it does seem to suggest a connection between Hannah and her killer. Hannah was very active on social media, as we've become aware. Some believe the possibility that she could have connected with someone online and that this person could have been a predator waiting to strike. Authorities have, however, gone through a thorough search of her social media as well as the family computer and found nothing to indicate that this is the case. 
What kind of chat logs the Nintendo DS keeps, I can't know for sure, but were any available, it's safe to say police would have been digging through them as well. Sadly, there's a lot of predators out there who use the internet to groom and stalk their victims, though in this case there doesn't seem to be anything to make that leap. Some have theorized that Hannah may have had a cell phone that her mother was unaware of, a private phone, so to speak, but if this was the case, police have never found any evidence of it, and if she had had it on her that night, whoever killed her may have taken it with them. But if it wasn't someone she didn't know, then it had to be someone she did know, in some way. You're talking about high school students, maybe early college, people Hannah could have interacted with on a weekly or daily basis. We know there was a boy that Hannah was interested in. We know that there was a boy who was interested in her. It's not uncommon for things like this to develop into violent issues, but would it truly be something so bad that it would have resulted in the 16-year-old being the victim of a brutal murder? Stranger things have happened, sadly. Police thoroughly combed through everyone they could find in Hannah's life who could potentially be a suspect. They questioned some people multiple times, and while some did not cooperate, others did. Those who did not cooperate may be amongst those they'd like to find connections to, but how many kids in high school possess the ability to hide something this monstrous? Kids talk. There's rumors and gossip. It's difficult for me to imagine this crime was committed by someone in her school, and not even so much of a whisper has ever reached the ears of investigators. Well, Maybe something has, and they simply can't prove it. One theory is that Hannah may have had a routine. This routine could have involved going into the woods to meet up with someone, maybe a boyfriend, maybe a friend, and it was either this person or someone who knew about the meetups who may have orchestrated the murder. It certainly does look like something that could have been true. I don't mean to make any assumptions about Hannah or her activities, but it would hardly be the first time a couple of teenagers used the cover of Woods to hide private interactions. I didn't really want to address this, but I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't. It's important for me to preface this by saying there has never been anything reported officially to confirm any of this. It is mere speculation from some who have looked at the case and considered their own theories. There's a theory that Hannah was seeing someone, possibly an older man. Some have argued that Hannah may have become pregnant at some point prior to her death. They note tweets about her stomach growing, getting fat, back pain, sore ankles, and a particular tweet in which she addresses an unknown male saying they fucked up. Some have gone so far as to assume that her so scared right now tweet is directly addressing this possibility. However, a lot of this seems to be unfounded. Hannah was active. She ran. She did gymnastics. It wouldn't be uncommon for her to experience aches and pains associated with that. As for the stomach comment, I mean, how many teenage girls don't think they're getting fat? It's important to note, Hannah also made tweets about not becoming pregnant until she found the right man, as she wanted to raise her children in a loving, tight family environment. But we also know teenagers make mistakes. They make choices in the moment that could impact them for years after. I didn't know Hannah, and I believe all of the good things that were said about her, but I'm also not naive, and while I see nothing to indicate that she was pregnant, I also can't say for certain that there wasn't the potential. I know what I was doing at 16, and I'm pretty sure my parents would have been shocked if they knew about it. All of this is speculative and hard to work with, but I did want to address it. When it comes down to this, certainly the police know the truth of it, and I find it hard to believe they wouldn't have addressed it by now. You'd have to assume if there was a pregnancy, even if they didn't announce it, they'd have a suspect in mind. Someone would have known about her intimacy with a partner, more than likely her close friends, and as far as we know, that's never been said. Also, just to note it for those who do believe this theory, the age of consent in Georgia is 16 which Hannah was, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that she could have been sexually active, and that could open the door to a lot of different possibilities in this case. Some believe she may have had a relationship with an older man who was afraid of being found guilty of statutory rape, but again, considering she was beyond the age of consent, that really doesn't make any sense. While the details have never been revealed, and perhaps rightfully so, It would be interesting to know the locations of where she was stabbed, whether it was in the stomach area or elsewhere. 
that could certainly lead to some series of questions about this angle. One thing about this case which fascinates me is how Jeff described his daughter, saying that her face was all scratched up and to him it seemed like she may have been in a fight with a female. That's an interesting angle to look at. Now, maybe it's assumption bias or the likelihood of the attacker being male. And I mean no disrespect here, but oftentimes we don't consider that such a crime could have been committed by a woman. Now sure, a man could have scratched her face just as easily, so maybe it's all a red herring, but considering the marks on her face, it wouldn't be difficult to imagine that someone may have wanted to target her looks, or perhaps insult her in the process of killing her. We know there was somewhat of a love triangle issue here, although Hannah's interests were purely in someone else. There is the possibility, though, that someone else had an interest in the same person, and this became a battle of jealousy. I don't think that's something we can rule out, a fight with another woman or multiple women. We all know how teenagers get when it comes to love, boyfriends and girlfriends. It's like the rest of their world drops away and all that matters is the other person. How many teenagers get into fights in school every day over a boy or a girl? It happens all the time. It just usually doesn't lead to murder. Of course, if there was a girl who had a problem with Hannah, would she have willingly went into the woods with this person? Probably not. Her most likely response would have been to have tried to get back home to not have to deal with the angry person. And I find it difficult to believe this person was just hiding out waiting for Hannah to maybe walk by the woods. The scratches are interesting to me. It seems likely that Hannah would have fought back against her attacker, so how it was possible that nobody was found who went to school with Hannah or knew Hannah who had any kind of marks on them as though they had been fighting someone is strange to me. So, while some believe it could have been another girl at the school who attacked her, there's also the possibility that it could have been a boy. Could it have been a jealous boy? Maybe a friend? Someone who had an interest in Hannah that either she didn't know about or that she had dismissed in the past. If she went into that woods willingly with her killer, then it's difficult to imagine it was anybody other than someone she trusted. Police questioned everyone who had even had a conversation with Hannah and couldn't find enough to move forward. But the fact that there are persons of interest they're looking at for more information does make me believe that someone they've spoken to in those first days rubbed them the wrong way or wasn't as cooperative as they could have been. If it was someone in school, that person either kept it to themselves really well or had a good alibi or someone else knows about the crime. More than likely, regardless of who it was, someone else knows about it. That brings me around to the belief that more than one person was present. Now, police have never said more than one person committed the crime, but they have implied the killer may not have been alone. If that was the case, you'd imagine a larger possibility of someone coming forward or someone sharing the information. I mean, it's like we've said before, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. There are around 10 different high schools in Hall County, with Gainesville High School being fairly centered. Riverside Military Academy is a few miles to the north. Chestatee High School is over seven miles to the northwest. East Hall High School is around eight miles to the northeast. Lanier College Career Academy is six miles to the south. I could keep going, but you get my point. There were a lot of schools in the area with students in Hannah's age range. I don't know about you, but I grew up in an area with three high schools in close proximity, and a lot of us knew each other, even if we didn't attend the same schools. I certainly knew guys and girls who dated people who went to nearby schools, so I think the possibility is there that this could have been someone Hannah knew by some measure, though not necessarily someone she knew extremely well. There's far too broad of a pool of people to draw from when it comes down to it, so you'd have to be able to narrow it down to the most likely perpetrators. I am sure the police have dug into this, and again, we know they have persons of interest. Whether or not those people attended Gainesville High School or a surrounding school, we can't say for sure. What we do know is this crime was violent, up close and personal, and whoever committed this crime had likely made it clear at some point that they had an issue with Hannah. I doubt this is something they never shared with anyone. In concluding this theory, we have to look again at the suspicious car. We can't know for certain if Hannah knew the driver or the passenger, but the sheer fact that the passenger apparently walked into the woods raises my suspicions. 
Could this have been a prearranged meetup spot with Hannah? Could this have been an older guy who knew her in some way and spent time with her? That's a question we don't have the answers to right now, but it's surely one which piques my interest. What bothers me, though, is the car itself. It's fairly distinctive, and authorities would have noticed if they'd found it in the possession of someone who knew Hannah. I'm sure they dug through DMV records, although they were dealing with the complication of having to search through what I imagine is thousands of records of similar vehicles in the area. But no one's ever come forward. No one's ever said they know that car, or they know the driver, or they also saw it in the area that day. We know the car was near Hannah at some point, so much so that police have said she may have been in it, but if that's the case, how the hell does no one in Hannah's life know about this car? I wouldn't be surprised if her parents didn't know. I mean, how many parents know everything about their teenagers, but wouldn't one of her friends have known? I find it hard to believe that someone who tweeted as much as Hannah did was in the business of keeping major secrets from her friends. But maybe she was. Either way, that car certainly seems to be involved somehow, and if it isn't, then the driver and his passenger might have more information than they think they do. To me, though, the fact that this guy apparently walked down into the tree line and Hannah was found murdered in the woods the next day makes it almost impossible for me to not make that connection. The only thing we know for certain in this case, unfortunately, is that someone out there knows exactly what happened to Hannah that night. It's been eight years since Hannah True Love was murdered, and her case remains unsolved. For friends and family, it's a horrifying and tragic event from which there's no escape. How could someone so violently and brutally take the life of a 16-year-old and no word about it ever comes to the surface? Multiple times, police and Hannah's family have made pleas to the public searching for tips, searching for answers. While some have certainly given tips, more is needed, and sadly, in the past few years, the well has begun to run dry. Tips aren't coming in like they used to, and police are at a loss for where to go next. Someone knows what happened. Someone knows the truth. Someone knows who the killer is, and that person possesses the ability to grant closure and justice to her family, who will never be able to move on, but who might be comforted by seeing her killer locked away. If only that person would come forward. But until they do, or the police get a major break, the murder of Hannah Truelove will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Hannah Truelove, there are many websites, news articles, and forums discussing her case. If you have any information about the murder of Hannah Truelove, you can contact the Hall County CID line at 770-503-3232 or the GBI tip line at 1-800-597-8477. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Tag me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod or comment in the Facebook group. So I've had a couple of people ask me about the availability of Trace Evidence merchandise. There's a couple of places you can go. You can go to traceevidence.threadless.com to see the wide selection of t-shirts and stickers and other items. You can also just go straight to the website trace-evidence.com and click the merch link in the header, which will provide you with links to places where all Trace Evidence merchandise is available. One final note, are you planning to attend CrimeCon this year in Orlando? If you are and you haven't yet purchased your ticket, you can use the promo code TRACE2020 to get 10% off today. I'm going to be there on Podcast Row representing Trace Evidence, and I would love to see you there. So, when purchasing your tickets, use promo code TRACE2020, and I look forward to seeing you. It's time to thank our Patreon producers. Special shout out to Tara Doble, Alicia Lorraine, Angie Dodd, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Roberta Jansen, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Brett Eady, Kevin Bonham, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Gerard Lopez Barbosa, Jessica, 
Laura Dickinson, Linda Halcrow, Nick Mohar Schurz, Megan Cotter, Quinn McBreen, Randy Wyland, Robbie Blue, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. If you think your name should be on this list but it's not, please contact me as Patreon is often terrible at organizing the lists properly. I want to thank you for listening to this episode. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.